breaking into programming here as we follow breaking news in Seattle. A duck tour bus has been involved in a head-on crash with a charter bus. We're learning there are several people injured here. Clearly, this is a mass casualty casualty incident here. Rescue crews are working hard here, getting patients to the hospital, and uh, this is a very fluid situation here as we can now zoom out and sort of see some of the damage to the side of that charter bus, and as we watch, Mimi, it does look like they're pulling people mostly out of that bus that mm -hmm. appear to be injured. If you're following along on Twitter, which I'm sure a lot of you are sort of getting updates here, one of the reporters with the Seattle Times, Jennifer Sullivan, we are news partners, and she's on the street there who talked to a witness who says they were behind the Ducks vehicle, and she just tweeted this saying, that witness says the Ducks vehicle swerved hard to the left, then slammed into a car and then into the tour bus. Two fatalities and Oof. nine people have been critically critical. hurt. Oh my God. That just coming in from the yep. Seattle Fire Department. New developments this noon hour in the assault and possible attempted murder of a Bothell High School teacher. Investigators continue to comb through evidence while the hunt for the attacker continues today. King 5's Michael Konoposik live this noon with new information on this investigation. Michael? A former Tukwila police officer is now charged with using excessive force. A federal grand jury indicted Nick Hogan for violating a prisoner's civil rights. Authorities say Hogan pepper sprayed a man restrained on a gurney in Harborview's emergency room in 2011. He's now a Snoqualmie police officer. We learned late today that that department has also suspended him. Hogan faces up to 10 years in prison and a quarter million dollar fine. And good Monday morning to all of you. We're tackling the issue of homelessness this morning, as you mentioned in our continuing series, State of Homelessness. We are, we're here at 1065 at Inner Bay. We've been here all morning long. People are just starting to wake up. Yeah. Some will actually be leaving here and going to work. Yeah, that's right, bags slung over their shoulder. Right. This is a very, very active camp of all of the tent cities uh, in the city. We've been talking with the residents here this morning. They're happy that we're here as well, tackling this issue. Yeah. Right here at Tent City 5, Governor, there are people that show up with vouchers from the state to try and pay for rent in King County. Right. Some of them say, I get a check for $800 from the state. You can't find a place to rent right. in King County in Seattle for right. $800. What can you do about that? Well, Governor, you drive into Seattle, you see the tents. I mean, for God's sakes, what can we do to just help the people right there? Pull them out of the I jungle, mean, so disgrace. to speak. Let's it's absolutely So there's terrible. a lot of things we can and should do. Eye-catching indeed. Got to take a few rides. The delegation I was with had a chance to ride in these things as well. Pretty sweet. But it isn't as much what the cars look like on the old streets of Havana as it is what they symbolize. Along with the charm of Havana, there seems to be a picture on every street corner. And you might say, on the street, there's art. In a lot of ways, Havana is a rolling car museum. Everywhere you look, there's an American classic with iconic brands like Buick or Ford etched in that signature chrome. Me siento bien con este. For Juan Alfonso, a 56 Chevy will do. Es cómodo, grande. It's big y, y and fast. Veloz. This is another example of the Cubans making the best of what little the communist government affords them. They're here because in the 60s, when Fidel Castro took over, U.S.-Cuba relations soured. American imports stopped. No more parts. There are other foreign models out there. But it's still as if Cuba is frozen in time. Hola. So hop in. Every owner we talk to is beaming with pride. Antigua, todo clásico. They've managed to find all the parts they need. There are a lot of them. And I can always find something. And over time, a new engine that fits. This one's surviving just fine. What's a classic American car without classic American music? Eagles. Eagles. I like Eagles and old American music of the 1780s and 90s. I applaud these guys for, for what they uh, uh, love legend. in this car. For American car lovers like curator Scott Kelly. This, this has got an artistic uh, look to it. Observing from Tacoma's America's Car Museum, the cars are a symbol of strength so and ingenuity. It's not like a car you would generally see that fits into, you know, the more traditional collector car um, world in the United States. They're all patched together to keep them running all these years, so it's not uncommon to find a Korean diesel engine under the hood, not exactly fresh off the assembly line, but it's their own, and the cars are as much a part of the culture as rum and cigars. Yeah, this, the, those are creations. It's like you know, saying to an artist, you know, can I buy your, your, you know, your sculpture or your painting from you? I mean, that's their, their expression. Uh, they've got an emotional connection. It's not just a rational, 
uh, connection with a car that they kept running. And if the Cubans have kept them alive all these years, who needs a Fiat? Well, I prefer this one. American car lovers chomping at the bit to get to Cuba and check these things out. <laughs> but even if the U.S. embargo is fully lifted, don't expect these cars to really, you know, hop over to the United States very quickly. It's just going to be really expensive. Not to mention, I did not find very many Cubans who are really willing to part with these cars. <laughs> they love them so much. Sitting around, Jake, waiting to pick people up. They is are, that sort of the case? Yeah, they're all over the streets. You know, and since the government's really been loosening up, they have been allowing these car owners to use them as taxi cabs to make a little extra money on the side. But as it was recommended to me, take the yellow cab if you go to Cuba <laughs> because they're government-owned, more reliable. You know, you know that you're going to get a fixed price. But... I couldn't resist. Had to ride long. Good morning, everybody. We are back at 1075 this morning in Seattle's Inner Bay neighborhood as we take a comprehensive look at the state of homelessness here in our city, our county, and in our neighborhoods in Washington State. We want to first here take a look back at a plan 11 years later. It was started as the 10-year plan to end homelessness. King 5's Alex Rozier took a comprehensive look at that and spoke to people about the successes and the failures of this program. Alex, what'd you find out? One of the biggest questions that people ask, advocates say they get asked all the time, is where do these folks come from? Right. Do they live here? Are they from outside of the state, outside of this particular zip code? We went out to try to find the answer to that question, and the answer may surprise you. As thousands flock to a thriving Seattle these days looking for big opportunities, they'll also find a growing homeless population here too, full of many others who came looking for the same thing. There's work here, it's just not enough work for everybody to afford a home. Robert and Ashley Bowen moved here from San Francisco hoping one of those jobs could be theirs. But five months later, they live here in Tent City 5. It's just a fantastic place to be, it's just that the price of living is cost more and they see how much their paycheck is and they see how much rent is and they have to re reevaluate their situation. The Bowen story can be told over and over again here, but according to the most recent 2014 survey from Seattle-based All Home, only 8% of the homeless come from outside Washington State, and overwhelming 86% of people living on King County streets are from King County. So I grew up in Magnolia. That's Pete Suka. Second hill over. I've been here 50 years. He says these days the tent cities are a place where locals like him try hard to get back on their feet. I drank myself here. I lost my fiance. I haven't seen my kids in a while, but I'm starting to build that back. So is Charlie Johnson, also from Seattle, who says the growing number of resources for the homeless is attracting people too. This is the place that's drawing people for jobs, for, for opportunities, but uh, I think it's also drawing people for help. Help and a better life close to home now with a new family. I adore them. Community, it's what makes people grow. So when the organization All Home conducted this survey, they asked people, mm -hmm. what was your last zip code of residence? And so that's how they did the survey. But a lot of people said the zip code downtown. So a lot of folks saying that the shelter was their last place of residence. A lot of people didn't answer. So it's a tough number to get at. But again, most people, they just want to stay here. 